As indicated in our sword search this morning, the word fasting. Yes, thank you, sir. Yep, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. God's chosen fast. Now, a lot of people fast. I've heard of people fasting lately, and I've heard ever since I was a kid going to, to church. You know, people have been on fast and for this and that, seeking the Lord's um, help in something or a blessing or, or whatever the case may be, or direction. Um, and there's some people fast with direction in mind. I know a lot of pastors tend to fast when, when there's a, a new calling has been given or whatever, and they've got to uproot themselves of where they are and move to another town or country or state. Um, a lot of pastors tend to fast and seek the Lord's will. But there's sometimes what I'm, I'm seeing today is that our perception of a fast is just going without food. And then all will be well. God will bless us if we starve ourselves for a day or two. Well, I really can't. I used to fast for three days in a row. And when I was a little bit younger, like five years ago, and I'd <laughs> start dropping weight, the keto diet would kick in. And then, you know, your weight starts dropping off. You get back to normal eating again. But these days, I just can't seem to do that. You know, after about 18 hours, I'm not feeling well. <laughs> I need to eat food. Um, there seems to be a difference, I believe, in a perception of what a fast is. So how does God want us to fast, if we are to fast? And fasting is a biblical principle. Actually, I noticed one of the verses we read this morning, I didn't include in my sermon, but um, it made me sit up and take notice. But we'll just read Matthew chapter 17 for a start, and we'll go down from 14 to 21. 14 to 21. The word of God says, and when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic and sore vexed, for oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. So this is this, this devil which is, is, is inflicting this, this, this uh, young person, this child, was trying to, to kill him. And verse 16, And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind of fasting goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. But by prayer and fasting. So the subject today in question is fasting. But just going back to, to the start of this chapter, we see that the first um, eight verses is talking about the transfiguration, where um, the three of the inner circle, Peter, James and John, were with Christ up to the mount, and, they, and Christ was transfigured before them. Now they heard from God the Father, and they saw Moses uh, and Elias talking with them, and then they came down from the mountain from verses 9 to 13. And Jesus at this time was telling them that, yes, Elias has come, and you're looking at him in the flesh. Okay? So that's what those portions of Scripture are about there. Then the disciples understood, and he spoke unto them of John the Baptist. So Elias, Elias came back in the form. It wasn't Elias it was a figure of this is Elias, this is John the Baptist, a prophet of God. And the first New Testament preacher, the first New Testament preacher. And then from verses 14 to 21, we see here in this account of what happened to this child who was lunatic, who was lunatic. But we see here at this portion of scripture, three points, three points. And I want to look at this with the word fasting in mind this morning. Maybe you've been, maybe you've been fasting about something. Or, or you have someone who you are praying for. Maybe it's, it's someone that, that needs saving. 
Maybe it's something that needs to happen. Maybe it's someone in your family circle that needs to come and know the Lord or whatever the situation may be. But we know just here first that there are three things. One, the disciples were powerless. They were powerless. They were unable to cure this man's child, this man's son. Point two, they were faithless. They were faithless. As the Lord says here in verse 20, if he have faith, see they didn't have a strong faith. But yes, you say, these were the disciples of Christ, yes. And they had issues and problems. Jesus often rebuked them because of their unbelief. And they were walking with Jesus. They were with him for three years, and yet they still doubted him. You know, I, I read again this week where someone said, you know, if all those people, would, would we be the same? So many people saw Christ crucified on the cross, and yet a lot of people went away in unbelief. Would we be the same? We have the word of God in front of us today, but people walk away in unbelief. In unbelief. They walk away not believing what the word of God says. And thirdly, they, they were prayerless. They were prayerless. It, this type cannot come about but by prayer and fasting. They were prayerless. But in verse 17, it says the word perverse. O oh, faithless, see that word again, and perverse generation. The word perverse here is showing a deliberate and obstinate desire to behave in a way that is unreasonable or unacceptable. That's what this generation was being accused of by Christ himself. They were perverse. You are obstinate and you are not behaving in a way that is reasonable. And you're doing it deliberately. That's what the word perverse means. What does 1 Timothy say? In 1 Timothy 6.5 it says here, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, just get a, get a hang here on the words, of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, they don't know the truth, they're destitute of it, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. Well, there's a prosperity gospel going out the window. They say that gain is godliness. Well, I'm sorry, Jesus didn't come to die to make you rich. He came to keep your feet out of hell. That's what he came for. That's, amen, that's what he came for. And what does the Lord say here in 1 Timothy? Withdraw thyself from these people. Don't even watch them on TV. Unless you want to learn what they do. That's fine. But don't be sucked in by them. Withdraw thyself. That is a command. So this is from a section of scripture in context regarding false teachers and we have plenty of them today this is the carnal mind in action spiritually destitute think on those words before we go into our next scripture spiritually destitute corruption in thinking that gain is godliness <clears throat> so often what we see here perverseness is an obstinate action perverseness is an obstinate action. Obstinate. The word obstinate. Obstinate. It means to stubbornly adhering to an opinion, purpose, or course, in spite of reason, arguments, or persuasion. It's an obstinate resistance to change. Think about our second nature, our bad nature, our wicked nature. Think on that one. A resistance to change. But yet we see here in our reading this morning that Jesus rebuked the evil spirit. He rebuked him. Just didn't cast him out. He rebuked him. The word rebuke, words are important. In the Bible, the term rebuke is used to convey a strong expression of disapproval, reproof or correction. It often implies a stern or sharp criticism, intending to correct someone's behavior, attitude or action. The concept of rebuke is closely tied to discipline, correction, and the pursuit of righteousness. So he rebuked the devil and he departed out of him and the child was cured from that very hour. When it was done properly. 
Whether it was done by someone who had the right attitude. Well, Christ was sinless. So the, the, this devil had no option but to leave. To live. And Christ had that power. You know, a lunatic is someone who is mentally ill or a person who does crazy things that are often dangerous. We probably know many people like that. I think oh, I probably could be classified as that myself, riding motorcycles, but I do it in the safest way that I possibly can. So these three words, perverseness, faithlessness, and prayerlessness. Perverseness, faithlessness, and prayerlessness was the center of the ability to cure, or in this case, not to cure, this child. The only prayer and fast, that only prayer and fasting could cure him. But the question is, what kind of fasting? What kind of fasting? So with this in mind, let's turn to Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58. And we'll read from verses 1 to 5. I'll give you a second just to turn it up. But Isaiah 58, 1 to 5. This first verse is interesting. This first verse is what a pastor should be doing. This first verse is what a pastor of any God-given church should be doing. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. This is what a pastor or a preacher should be doing. Not giving you a false sense of security and hope. This is what a pastor should be doing. A pastor must do this. But we shall read on. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. Many religious people do. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? So they're not getting answered to their prayers. Wherefore have we afflicted ourselves, going without food? And, take, and thou takest no knowledge? Can't you see, God, that I'm going hungry for this cause? Behold, in the day of your fast, ye find pleasure and exact all your labours. So these religious people here were oppressing the labourers beneath them. Behold, this is the Lord coming back at them. Behold, ye fast for strife and debate and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as ye do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. Is it such a fast that I have chosen? A fast for a man to afflict his soul just to go hungry? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush? Making as though, remember the Pharisees, they will pull long faces and that just so they would be recognised as fasting and all oh, their holy men. And to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Will you? So why is this fasting unacceptable to God? What's wrong with it if it's just going without food? What's wrong with it? What's wrong with it is that it left the sin in their lives untouched. That's what's wrong with it. That's what's wrong with it with fasting just by afflicting your soul if your sin hasn't been dealt with you've got to deal with it we've all got it the only authentic fasting is fasting that includes a spiritual attack against our own your own sin whatever else we fast for we must fast for our own holiness first kick the sin out get rid of it Attack it. Go to the Lord. Ask for help. Seek and he shall find. He will help. But it does take effort on your part to remove yourself from sin. We cannot fast for anything with authenticity while living in known sin. The only authentic praying is praying that includes an attack against your own sin. 
The only authentic worship is worship that includes at least an implicit attack against your own sin. Will God accept your worship if you're living in sin knowingly? Will he? Will he accept your worship? If you're living in sin knowingly, thinking you're getting away with it? So point one is an assault against sin. Assault against sin. If there is unresolved or a unresolved pocket of sin in your life and you are fasting about something else, something else, some blessing, some healing perhaps, God's going to come to you and say, the fast that I choose though is for you to deal with your sin first. That's the fast that I've chosen. That's the fast that I have chosen. And the way he does that here is very striking in verse 5. It says that they were fasting and afflicted their souls. They were afflicting themselves, as I said, with hunger. With hunger. Which is a general understanding of fasting. But God says that this is not the fast that he chooses. It's not the fast that he chooses. He contrasts verse 5 with verse 10. He wants you to feed the hungry with what you're not eating. That's what he's telling these people here at this particular time. These people were going about who could afford food, while their labourers underneath them couldn't afford food. So they were fasting and not eating food, but not giving it to their employees. These religious fasters here were actually holding back good things from those under them, smiting them with the fists of wickedness. Verse 10, if I draw out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul instead of oppressing them. That's what's happening here. What we're seeing here is hypocrisy in action. Hypocrisy in action. They were hypocrites. And I fear many people today are hypocrites when it comes to fasting. The only authentic fasting is fasting that includes a spiritual attack on your own sin. The poor are hungry and afflicted, as it says in verse 10. These well-to-do religious people are also hungry and afflicted with fasting. But they hadn't dealt with their own hypocrisy. They hadn't dealt with their own sin because how they were oppressing the employees and those that were under them. But what are they fasting for? Is their fasting first a battle against their own sin? The sin of driving hard all their workers? The sin of putting a heavy yoke on the back of the poor? The sin of neglecting the needs of the poor for clothing and housing? No. That is not what they are fasting against. God says the fast that I choose is not that you religiously make yourselves hungry and afflicted, but that you make the poor less hungry and afflicted. If you want to fight sin by taking your bread away from your own mouth, then put it into the mouth of the poor. Then we will see if you are really fasting for righteousness sake, doing what is right. Doing what is right. That's the that's the occasion what we're watching here today in Isaiah 58. But we can apply it to ourselves, even with this wording, as it changes slightly. When we are living in sin. Say, the sin of hard-heartedness or deceit or injustice. These are some of the sins that we can afflict ourselves with. This wickedness. See, verse says, is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness? What about the bands of wickedness that, are, that you have against your own soul? The sin within you and myself. We need to loose the bands of wickedness, the iniquity that is in our lives. To loose, to undo the heavy burdens, the things that hold us down daily, weekly in our lives. And to let the oppressed go free 
and that ye break every yoke. What is holding you back from doing a fast that the Lord chooses? The Lord chooses. Some of our fasts could be deceit or injustice or fornication or adultery or addiction or things we know we shouldn't be doing like porn or coveting someone or something that does not long excuse me that does not belong to us the fists of wickedness the bands of wickedness that can hold us back knowingly we knowingly are doing these things and yet we ask God to answer our prayers whether fasting or not whether fasting or not and we're still living in this sin really the fast which God chooses is not a religious covering of this sin but a direct assault against this sin for these people fasting was not a fight against the besetting sin of their lies it was a camouflage a camouflage if we decide that we're going to fast for something in our own lives and expect God to to grant us our wish or our desires of our hearts it can be used as a camouflage that's probably why it's best not to tell everyone while you're fasting maybe a bit hard when we come for fellowship lunch afterwards I understand that maybe just say I'm not hungry today I'll just have a cup of tea instead I don't know but fasting is probably best done in private in private if they make themselves hungry a little bit and afflict themselves maybe it won't matter so much that they are indifferent to the hunger and affliction of the poor or maybe or maybe it won't matter regarding your own sin if you are concerned about someone's salvation that God will overlook your sin and answer prayer it's still a camouflage it's still a camouflage We've all got those things in our lives and we need to deal with it. If you want a blessing from God, which we'll see in a second, there is a positive to this, by the way. If you want a blessing from God, then you need to deal with it. All you've got to do is deal with the sin. You're just going to deal with it. Get it out of your life. <laughs> there you go. I'll use that later, maybe. <laughs> um, so that's what we're looking at here. It's dealing with this sin. But yet so many people say, oh, look, I'm fasting for this and I'm fasting for that. When you know darn well that that person's living in sin. Go figure. Will it be answered? Maybe by God's grace. But according to his word, it's not the fast that he's chosen. It's not the fast that he's chosen. It is a camouflage. So God comes and says, I will test your hearts. Go with our bread for the sake of the poor. Give it to them. In other words, get the hypocrisy out of your life. Get the sin out of your life first. That's the fast that I choose. Give up your sin. That's the fast that I choose. Then and only then will you see what God can do. This is where we take up again from verses 6 to 14. 6 to 14. In verses 6 to to 12 even, God describes what is involved in living out this fast and what the spectacular rewards are for living this way. Let's just go back to the Word of God. Verse 6, Is not this the day that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke? We can look at those ones who we are praying for and we are fasting for, we want to get them out of the bondage of sin, out of the bondage of Christlessness, out of the bondage of Satan's grasp on them, being deceived by this wicked world. Verse 7, is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? In other words, to help people. And that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house, when thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. In other words, we need to spread the gospel. Here it's, it's, it's the everyday living that these people were going without, being, in, being employed by wicked religious people with sin in their lives. They were dealing with them, the fists of wickedness. 
Do we really want to help people? Do we really want to see people saved? Do we really want people to be convinced by the gods, by God's words as we give it to them? When we hand someone a hand track, do we really want to see them released? See, they are our own flesh. Mankind. That's what this means here quite plainly in verse 7. And that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Probably the, your brothers and sisters in the flesh. We came from the same parents. They are our flesh. Don't you want to help them? And get the sin out of your own life. We need to get the sin out of our lives. And the more we've got these things stuck to our faces and computers and everything else, the more wickedness comes up. I was on a website this morning because I would like to have some trivia nights here. So, okay, let's see what's there. I got onto a site. Okay, oh, this looks good. Click on something else. Oh, no, it's not good. It's just the front for a porn site. Great. Bang. Thank you. Careful what you get onto on your phones, please. Careful. They're masquerading, camouflaging as a Christian website. You press on the wrong thing and then Satan's got you. Beware. I'm telling you. It looked good. Clicked on it. Hmm, not enough information. I'll just click on this and bang. Oh dear. It ain't good. It ain't good. But the thing is here, do you care enough? Do you care enough? Verse 8, then shall the light break. See, when you have dealt with your sin, with the iniquity that's holding you back, whatever has you in addiction and in its grasp and won't let you go, when you have given it to God and it has been released from you, that burden is gone, the yoke is not holding you back, then, in verse 8, shall the light break forth. Not that light, but thy light. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily in other words things will improve things will improve and thy righteousness shall go before thee the glory of the lord shall be thy re reward then shalt thou call and the lord shall answer thou shalt cry pray unto him when you're seeking for someone to be saved and he shall say here i am if thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke and the putting forth of the finger and speaking vanity, then I will bring these things to pass. You see, there is hope. There is hope. There is a positive. It's just not negative. We've just got to deal with our own sin. And then the positive comes through. And in verse 10, if thou draw out thy soul, to the hungry. In other words, your benevolence. You're benevolent. And satisfy the afflicted soul. Then shall thy light rise in obscurity and thy darkness be as the noon day. So you will radiate in spiritual light. People will see that you are serious, that you mean business, and that you are doing work for the Lord. They will see this. And when you're giving them the gospel, they will listen. But you need to deal with your own iniquity first. And the Lord shall guide thee continually, in verse 11. Guide thee continually. And satisfy thy soul in drought, and make fat thy bones... And thou shalt be like a what? A watered garden. Not all dried up. I was amazed yesterday as I went with a bit of a drive with Nate around the country. How dry things really were before it rained the other day. I mean, they were dry. <laughs> I, I haven't been out of Wang for probably a month or two. Hiding behind two, four, or in between four walls working. But the thing, it was dry. It needed watering. And we've got that water. I hope we've said our prayer of thanks. The Lord forgive us an inch or two. We needed it. Really needed it. But you will be like a watered garden 
and like a spring of water whose waters fail not. You see, if you deal with your sin and then you're praying for someone or something, it will happen. But you've got to deal with your sin. It may not happen exactly as you think, but it will happen. I've got family members I'm still praying for. And I'm still got to deal with my sin and leave it up to the Lord to bless. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt rise up the foundations of many generations. And thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. Wow. Wow. You see, by you fasting, God's chosen fast will be a blessing to others. That's the fast the Lord wants. Not a selfish fast. Whether it's for more money or fame or whatever else the case could be. The fast that the Lord wants is a fast that helps others. This is the fast that I have chosen. Others' best interests at heart. If thou turn away thy foot, in verse 13, from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord and honourable, and shalt honour him, not doing thine own ways, not playing football, not going elsewhere, not finding thine own pleasure, not playing soccer, nor speaking thine own words, doing what you want to do on a Sunday. That's what I get out of this verse. What's happened to Sunday? Oh, well, Junior's got to play football. Really? And don't play football. Take Junior to church. But what do many Christian people do today? Shopping, thank you. There's a good one. We'll go shopping on Sunday instead. Thank you. Perfect. Let's go do something else except go to church. Let's just dream up some excuse and not go to church. Ah. It's a bit more to this than meets the eye. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, we can apply Sunday worship here. The Sabbath day is finished. From doing thy pleasure. See, we just want to please ourselves. Mankind today, we, we're pleasure seekers. I get it. I get it. But to put it before God? No. What's the Lord saying? That's not my fast. I don't want you not meeting. I want you here. I died for my church. The church that the Lord founded, his New Testament church with his apostles, he died for that church, as well as everyone who belongs to the family of God. But he, he said he died for his church in a special way. His church, his organised assembly, his baptised assembly. This is, a, this is the fast that he has chosen. This is called self-denial. Self-denial. We deny those pleasures in our lives that keep us away on a Sunday or just from simply reading the Word of God. We'd rather stick this in front of our face. We'd rather turn on the TV when we should be into the book. Not Facebook, the book. Not TikTok, as it's TikToking away in time. This is a timeless book. And then I've had Christians tell me, oh, it's old fashioned, especially when it comes to adultery and fornication. Excuse me? It's written outside of time. This is the end book for right now. But that's what I hear. Oh, it's old fashioned. No. If you're not married, you're living in fornication every day of your life until you get married. Don't expect to be blessed. Change 
as you know you should. Is not this the fast that I have chosen? This is what the Lord is telling us. It's not all negative Nancy. This is about being positive Percy or positive Peter. You can be positive about life. You've just got to get the negativity out, which is your sin. That's all it is. Get the sin out of our lives. And then we can be blessed, oh good grief the time, in this way. In finishing. Verse 14. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. Wow. This is the light at the end of the tunnel. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places. In other words, you are going to be exalted of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father. For the mouth of the Lord hath, what? Spoken it. <laughs> we know the word of the Lord is sure. Spoken word is sure. It is his words. It's as good as happened. It'll be done unto you, but deal with your sin first. That's the fast that I have chosen. If you want your life to change, if you want your life to change, if you want your lives to change, then choose his fast. Choose his fast. There is no other way. And there is a blessing at the end of it. There is a blessing at the end of it. This is the Lord's prescription. That's the fast that the Lord prescribes. Brethren, this is what we must do. We just must submit. Don't worry about the world around us. You know, the world around us wants to, to mock at us, to, to laugh at us, think we're old-fashioned. I, I, I don't see how a book like this can be old-fashioned when it is up-to-date on the very things that are happening in the world right now. What the time that we're living in now, my father would be rolling his grave trying to get out to see it happening. <laughs> he really would. Because he was telling me all about this in my youth. And I'm, I'm looking at it now and I'm saying, wow, this, this has happened quick. What's going on in the world now is happening quick. So what we need to be doing now as a people, as a group, as a church, as part of his family as well, is a great command. He said to go. He said to go. Tell others about Christ. But deal with your own sin first. The apostles were no different. If you go back to Matthew, what do those words say? In Matthew 18, excuse me, Matthew 17. Verse 20. And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief, he just pointed the finger at his disciples and said, it's your unbelief. You wouldn't believe that I could help you. You still have sin in your life of unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible. Nothing shall be impossible to you. That's why he's using this illustration of a mountain. He's not saying you're going to move Mount Buffalo over to Mount Bogon. What he's saying in the illustrator is nothing will be impossible. It is possible. Just trust me, submit unto me, rid the wickedness out of your life and just do it. Just do it. We need to submit. We need to submit. As his disciples, and that's what we are, we follow Christ. How about we just follow his words and believe his words, not doubting his words. The sin of doubt's a big sin. Let's not be amongst those who doubt the word of God. Let's believe it and receive it. And then you will receive a blessing. Heavenly Father, we're thankful.